Good afternoon, everyone. So my job is actually very easy because I've spent about two days listening now about limitation of liability for oil pollution. Um, so when I had the task of considering both UK and South African case law, I, I really don't have to go too much into the UK case law at this juncture because Professor, Professor Martinez shared a lot of that case law with us in any event. So I thought, well, I'll use the UK as an example of a country that has quite a robust liability regime for these kind of events um, and contrast it to South Africa, which does not. Um, and really <laughs> contrast it to some of the issues that are emerging in South Africa because we don't really have strong frameworks in place. In fact, it's incredibly confusing to figure out what on earth is going on in South Africa. Very few things are reported. I'm not quite sure how SAMHSA, the South African Marine Safety Authority, really recuperates much of its funds. This information is really, really hard to access. Um, so I'll start a bit with the UK to talk about why the UK is, has got such a plethora of case law. And it started with the Tory Canyon, which was devastating to the UK. Um, we know this happened on the southwest coastline of the British Isle. And there were a number of affected parties who sought to make claims for compensation. And I'm sure many of us are familiar with this case. We know that in the absence of an international compensation regime, there was a myriad of legal hurdles here. So there were jurisdictional issues, there were common law claims, and there were some issues surrounding limits to compensation. So we had this jurisdictional issue where the British government issued a writ for damages in the Admiralty Court in London. And they also were seeking to perhaps attach the sister ships involved. But there was an immediate problem here yeah, because the initial ship itself, the Tory Canyon had itself sunk. There was a remaining lifeboat, but that wasn't really worth attaching. Um, and the problem with the sister ships was that they were very unlikely to come within UK waters. So how were they gonna be arrested? But as luck would have it, one of the sister ships on her way to the Persian Gulf called in at a Singapore port where she was arrested by British officials. However, her insurers paid a fee and paid security to have her released. And the French managed to establish jurisdiction um, when one of the sister ships arrived in Rotterdam. And eventually it was agreed between the owners of the vessel and the British government um, that there would be proceedings heard in London. So jurisdiction was a bit of a mess in this case, trying to establish it. There were also common law issues in English law. So we know that civil actions for oil pollution at this time were limited to the remedies you had within the common law, and particularly the law of torts, which has these categories of torts, such as nuisance, trespass, and negligence. How are we going to deal with this? What category of tort were we going to put it into? And previous precedent illustrated some difficulties because we had the South Port Corporation and Esso Petroleum case where the House of Lords provided polluting ship owners with the defense of necessity. So they had discharged oil to save life and vessel, and it was deemed to be a necessary act in that case to actually save the vessel. So this is the precedent we were working with where you had a full defense. Um, and we also weren't quite sure where we were going to put this into the realms of torts. So the British were quite instrumental in bringing about the 1969 International Convention on Civil Liability for Oil Pollution. They went to the IMO and swiftly called for a new international regime immediately. They submitted a note to the IMO um, saying that they needed to be uh, immediate change in international maritime law and practice governing pollution. There were proposals put forth from which emerged the CLC 1969, which we know is a uniform international system of rules and procedures for determining questions of liability and providing adequate compensation to persons who suffered damage resulting from oil spills from ships. So the British had a real agenda here to drive limitation of liability and to drive particularly compensation. And we know that they have ratified almost all of the major conventions. They have not yet ratified the HNS convention, but they do have first tier compensation in accordance with the CLC protocol. They have second tier compensation as well as third. And they have also ratified the International Convention on Civil Liability for Bunker Oil Pollution Damage. 
So the only thing that they have yet to ratify is the HMS Convention. These claims are dealt with under common law and the limitations are provided by the LLMC. So that is the position in English law. And a lot of case law has emerged out of the UK. So Professor Martinez went over many of the ones I was thinking about discussing, so I'm not going to repeat them. So I also know I'm the only thing standing between everyone and the end of the day. So I won't repeat all the case law that emerged out of this, but you can see there was a real history here of incidents and disputes being dealt with in British courts and a number of devastating instances that the UK really needed to deal with and grapple with in terms of seeking out the meaning of words of various conventions, um, because it really was a hotbed of legal disputes arising from oil spill claims. So that is why the UK has probably a more developed uh, case law um, package surrounding all of the issues surrounding limitation of liability and compensation for not only persistent oil as well as bunker oil. Now, if we have a look at South Africa, the situation is vastly, vastly different. You'll see that South Africa has a vast, vast coastline, which would make you think, well, isn't it very vulnerable and susceptible to oil spills? Which it is. There have been a number of incidents over the last six, seven decades. But unfortunately, I don't think any of them have been big enough to be a real impetus for major change. Okay, so you can see that up until 1994, that is where most of the incidents took place. And in recent decades, there haven't been any real major incidents. 1994 was such a pivotal time because when the new government came in, the post-apartheid democracy, um, Nelson Mandela's government instituted the first democratic government. We had the constitution come in and we, it was the formation of a new constitutional democracy. And that was really only as far back as we can go to paint the picture of what South Africa does about these things. Because the apartheid government has kept all of its records pretty secretive, pretty restricted. It's hard to go back in time. You can find various judgments relating to maritime claims in general, admiralty claims that might have been connected to an oil spill incident. Uh, but it's very hard to actually find case law at all or any information at all pertaining to where they received compensation and how much they were able to sue ship owners for and how much insurance was paid out. And perhaps the situation is not much better in the new democracy in terms of transparency and openness. Uh, and that is because most of these smaller incidents have been handled by SAMHSA, the South African Maritime um, Safety Authority. And what they do is once an oil spill or threat has been identified and reported, SAMHSA comes in, does most of the rehabilitation work, and we're not quite sure how they recuperate their costs, but as a government agency, they seem to prefer fines. They prefer criminal sanctions and fines, which don't really have a compensatory purport. It's more punitive. And they seem to issue fines, and we're not really sure where they claim expenses back from. There seems to be this gap as to where, but perhaps, you know, it's taxpayers' money, so anything goes. So these more minor incidents that I say minor, but they were not minor for obviously the ecosystems involved. We have a huge problem with these spill um, in that penguins, the African penguin is mostly affected. So the policy happening in 1994, 10,000 African penguins were oiled from the sinking of the ship. And of those oiled penguins, only 4,700 were rehabilitated and released. We had the MV Treasure in 2000, in which 20,000 penguins were oiled. They all required rehabilitation. And there was also a preemptive capture system to capture those um, that they thought might have been impacted or were going to be impacted by the damage of the spill. Now, these rehabilitation efforts um, are quite complex when it comes to the African penguin because you can't simply just wash down a penguin and release it. Okay, the penguins have a lot of natural oils in their feathers that take them about four months to kind of develop again. So for four months, you have to keep them in rehabilitation centers after they have been washed. You have to force feed them. They're not very good eaters. Um, so it's a lot of manpower to feed a penguin every, three times a day. You've got to really shove the fish down their throat. 
So these, these are like really, really kind of intensive rehabilitation programs. And the cost is pretty much picked up by the South African Department of Environment and Affairs. Um, and you can see because these incidents were quite small, SAMHSA came in and dealt with them. You didn't have claims coming from industry and private actors. It was really just SAMHSA dealing with these incidents. Hence, we don't have much case law. But these costs are costs nevertheless that get passed down to the taxpayer. So we have the African penguin situation because they are always the most vulnerable when there's an oil spill. So there's huge rehabilitation efforts surrounding coastline, surrounding bird life. Um, and we only have available data on the costs of these spills back to 1994 when the new democracy emerged. You can see some of the costs involved. So the Apollo Sea oil spill was about 27 million in euros. That might be 1.5 million euros. You see the most expensive one goes up to about the NV SETI. And the reason the SETI one was so expensive um, was because really the owner was kind of a disappearing owner. We still don't quite know what happened there between owners and insurers, but the end result was that for the SETI one, the entire bill was picked up by the taxpayers. The other ones, some money was recuperated through fines, um, but we're not quite sure why SAMHSA didn't try and pursue um, claiming funds back from the international funds that are available, probably because South African law was quite late to enact many of the international conventions into domestic law. So although they acceded to the CLC in 1976, and enacted it through their own Marine Pollution Control and Civil Liability Act. They also became a party to the CLC protocol in 2004. But if you look from that time onwards, there was a huge, almost a decade passed before they enacted these conventions into local legislation. And part of the South African constitution says that if you're gonna ratify or accede to any international law, it needs to be drafted into domestic law through a legislative act of parliament. And they were very late to do this. And they weren't making oil spills after 2013. So we didn't really have any disputes surrounding these kinds of liability issues. Um, and it was kind of devastating because the, the result was undercompensation up until this point. Uh, so we have at the moment first tier compensation. We have, I mean, the limitation of liability. Then we have second tier. We do not have third tier. So we have not acceded to um, the supplementary fund. And because this legislation was so late, South Africa had to pay contributions which had accumulated as shipping companies refused to pay the outstanding amount. So the government had to pick up the bill, which means the taxpayer picked up the bill for outstanding contributions up until 2013, from the time we actually became party to the CLC protocol. When it comes to bunker oil, we have not ratified the International Convention on Civil Liability for Bunker Oil Pollution Damage. We still deal with this under old legislation, namely the South African Marine Pollution Control and Civil Liability Act, which provides for bunker spills, oil pollution damage, and limitation of liability, and it deals with bunker oil as a normal maritime thing. It has a limit ceiling of 14 million union units of accounts, which is lower than that provided by the 1992 CLC and the Bunker Convention. And while Article 7 of the Bunker Convention requires registered owners of a ship having a gross tonnage greater than 10,000 registered in a state party to maintain insurance or other financial security, the MPCPLA does not have that requirement. So there's a big gap here. We're dealing with bunker oil spills from outdated legislation that has much lower limits. And the result is inadequate compensation. So the insurance claims for the seabird rescues during the Apollo sea spill was only a small amount of 589,000 dollars. The MV treasure spill, we only managed to get owner to pay 1.4 million US dollars. And in both of these cases, the payments were relatively small sums for the companies. There were also delays in these payments in respect of vessel source bunker oil pollution. And this often leads to disappointments and dissolution of claimants who are paid inadequate compensation and who may experience several years of delay in receiving compensation. So for example, when it came to the Apollo sea spill, 
compensation for pollution damage was paid to South Africa by the ship's insurer. Offit claims were made. However, it took about several years before compensating any claimants. We also had the MV Chrysanti S. This was also a major incident of inadequate compensation in 2019, uh, which resulted in 0.4 tons of oil, also involving bunker fuel, being spilled in South African waters. The owner of the MV Chrysanti was found liable and was fined only a measly 25,000 US dollars by the South African Maritime Safety Authority. So we know there's some big, big gaps here in South African law as to how to deal with these incidents and quite possibly because we haven't had a massively devastating incident where claims have been millions and millions plus. But there is still great, great cause for concern because there probably will be an incident in upcoming years. It's inevitable given the amount of sea traffic that comes through South African ports. And we know South Africa is not a party to the Bunker Convention. Despite the fact that it submitted part of a joint submission to the IMO's legal committee at the time the Bunker Convention was being drafted, calling for one. So South Africa is one of the voices calling for the Bunker Convention and then just didn't do anything about it once it was actually drafted. So there is no third tier compensation. It is not part of the supplementary fund protocol. And in enactments of the various amendments of the CLC protocol in general, and in particular the amendments of the limits of liability in the CLC protocol, as provided by its Merchant Shipping Act, is not automatic. Therefore, there are lengthy time periods to update limits. You're constantly waiting for Parliament to stay abreast of things and then to update local legislation. The High Court of South Africa deals with oil pollution cases. It decides on limits and the owner must constitute fund with court and pay compensation to the court through the rules of subrogation. Despite the High Court dealing with this, if you go into South African databases looking for any case law, you will not find any, which is quite bizarre. You can find, as I said, some sort of admiralty claims some cargo claims, but nothing resulting from the damage caused by oil pollution. So I wanna talk about the Selly one an incident which happened in 2009. Now, bear in mind, this was before 2013 when all the conventions were enacted into domestic law. So it was quite early on in 2009. We also didn't have the Nairobi International Convention of Removal of Wrecks at this time. But it was quite a unique situation because the entire cost of mitigation procedures, the entire cost of cleanup and salvage were completely covered by South Africa's Maritime Safety Agency. So in this case, the Selly one grounded on Bloberg coastline. And the reason why the Selly one is also probably for more personal reasons, something I wanted to focus on, because this is my home beach. This is where I grew up. I was a teenager when this boat um, arrived on Bloberg Beach and was stranded. We all thought it was something very cool to look at at the time until oil started leaking from the vessel and washing up onto our beach. It was a Turkish owned handy sized bulker. It was insured for hull risks by a Russian insurer and for PNI by German insurers. And what happened at the time is that the insurers said that the owner had defaulted on an express condition of the policies concerned and they withdrew insurance cover. So this was it for all of this intents and purposes an uninsured vessel. The Selvers had received an order from Lloyd's Open Form Arbitrate in London, which had directed the owners or their insurers to put up a 2.8 million claim in security for Smith's special compensation claim. So the solvers were got an arbitration ward to um, proceed with some of the salvage work. But SAMHSA also instructed, the South African Maritime um, Safety Agency had also instructed the solvers to remove all oils and contaminants on board. However, at the end of all of this, the owner was unable to pay, and we had a situation where the owner essentially disappeared. The owner was a, a corporation that kind of vanished into thin air. The insurers were not interested. They said there was no longer any insurance cover. So South Africa had to pick up the mitigation and cleanup costs. It was also prior to the Nairobi International Convention on the Removal of Wrecks. So there were not many things yet that could have been explored. It's well, kind of explored in terms of fund compensation. 
Um, the oil that was spilled was bunker oil, and it was a very, very small amount. The main issue here was salvage and wreck removal. However, for locals involved, it wasn't entirely a bad thing once the oil was a relatively small spill. It gave locals a great sense of joy because it created the perfect surf conditions. It created a kind of bank, um, which waves came around. So you had the perfect uh, wave barrels on either side coming around. And I've also got some photographs to share of trespassers, namely my brother and his best friend at the time, who would often swim up to the vessel, climb it, which is a highly dangerous thing to do. But you can see here what the inside of the wreck looked like. Um, they would go in with the GoPro quite often and have a lot of fun exploring all the sea life that grew in there. So you can see them there. But really the conclusion is that there's generally a lack of case law emerging from South Africa regarding compensation because legal disputes prior to 1994 are not within the public domain. Post-1994, the government has been incredibly slow to enact enabling legislation Taxpayers pick up the bill. The South African Maritime Safety Association generally comes in, deals with these things. Uh, they are funded by the Department of Environmental Affairs. They like to issue fines. And any private persons who want to get involved with cleanup can directly apply to compensation to the Department of Environmental Affairs or whatever might have cost them in their small capacity to assist with cleanup or if it was on their private property that needed cleaning up. So. We haven't yet had a huge scale disaster where you've had private claimants coming in seeking huge amounts of money. And SAMHSA for the present time seems quite happy to issue its rather small fines and use taxpayers' money. And we know this stands in strong contrast with the UK, which has been instrumental in establishing a legal compensation regime at the IMO. It acted quickly to enact necessary legislation and therefore has had time to deal with disputes around technicalities and definitions. So you can see there by point of contrast, just how markedly different the two jurisdictions are in terms of dealing with oil spill pollutions. And I sincerely hope we don't need a major catastrophe to learn our lesson, uh, to realize that we need to be quicker to uh, ratify and enact these international conventions. Um, so that is a worrying state of affairs. Uh, but might be necessary to spur developments in, you know, this legal area of compensation. And that's pretty much where I'm ending today. I see we're a bit ahead of time, so maybe we can have some questions. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So the insurance, insurer then will were ordered to pay about 2.8 million of some of the salvage costs. Um, but my understanding is there were additional costs relating to the cleanup of oil that South Africa had to had to bear the burden of. Mm -hmm. So this was salvage. I'm not quite sure what items exactly were the, the subject of the salvage in question, um, but they didn't do a complete job. There were extra things that needed to be done, which SAMHSA had instructed Smith to do in addition to what the arbitration of was. Mm -hmm. oh, in this case, they were instructed by SAMHSA. So yes, they did the cleanup job, but that instruction for cleanup and mitigation had come from the yeah. South African maritime. Yeah. The was, was just abandoned. Basically, yeah, it was abandoned. Um, luckily, luckily, mm -hmm. it wasn't a huge catastrophe in terms of oil. It was quite a minimal amount of oil. Um, the problem was, what do we do with this big vessel? And you saw it got stranded in 2009, 2013. You saw the pictures of my brother and his friend you did four years later. So it was just sat there, just sat there for ages and ages. It deteriorated. Uh, People grew quite fond of it in terms of water sports. We've got videos of kite surfers climbing up the mast and jumping off the mast. So, yeah, which is very dangerous to do. But, you know, these water sports people, they're a bit crazy. Uh, so. <laughs> 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 yeah.
Yeah. So, yeah. Anybody? It's bizarre to me why SAMHSA doesn't claim from these yeah. funds or get the ship owner to constitute funds in it. I, and it's really, really hard to find information. Maybe they do. I don't, that it's really hard to source information because unless something is reported in a court judgment, you don't know the facts. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure what is going on behind the scenes. I probably need to speak to experts in this particular area because this is not my area of expertise whatsoever. Um, but I would love to know what is actually going on in the in South African agencies and you know the Department of Environmental Affairs. Um, one I don't actually know that, that yeah so some of these small amounts like the city where we have no data on how much oil was actually spoiled it's estimated to be a small amount um, I'm not quite sure what happens. I don't know if SAMHSA just orders its cleanup by whatever company it employs or has its own cleanup and they don't, maybe they don't measure it. I really, it's, it's honestly been a big mystery for me. I really struggled to put this presentation together because of the lack of information that is out there. I just couldn't believe how little, you know, data I could access on these things. Um, and which really showed that it's quite a scary area of law and Surprisingly few academics have commented on it either, which is bizarre. You know, it's 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 yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I also don't know if it's just the South African government attitude of taxpayers' money means nothing to them. You know, <laughs> you've got a very corrupt government who pockets far more than these figures for their personal gain. So this is like small change for them, you know. So what if we, we lose this money, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there is something in the chat. I don't know if it's a, if it's a question or. Oh, no, it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alicia. Okay. 